The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Oh my goodness. The, the, I was so excited to know uh, Sarah Hirene was coming on the podcast. Uh, you are my first, Sarah, uh, Olympic gold medalist from the current crop of gold medalists from Tokyo 2020, which is still weird to say because it's 2021, but thanks for giving us some time amongst your 336 hours in MIQ, and welcome to the show, and congratulations! Awesome, thanks team for having me on, um, what an honour, it's cool! Oh man, we, I'm totally, totally excited, I've got several people who I've been like, you know, because they talk about who's coming up, now we're really lucky to have Emma Twig next week as well, and hopefully some others as we go through, but I'm like, Sarah Hedonay's coming on, and, and they were like, oh fuck, that's so awesome, you're so lucky, that's so cool, and I'm like, oh, it's true, so, you know, it's um, it's a very, very exciting time to speak to you, because, man, what a ride, what a ride, I mean, you're, you're, I guess you're now having a chance to stop and reflect for the first time. Um, what's what's those days in isolation been like when you've actually stopped and gone, holy crap, we're back and I have a gold medal in my carry-on? How's that been? <laughs> oh, it's been, it's just been amazing. Like, um, it's the first time in a very, very long time where I've not worried about things. I've not had something on my mind to do. Um, I've not to be honest, had to do my routine to prepare for training, to eat as well as I need to eat and <laughs> stuff like that. It's honestly been like a dream. And and I've heard horror stories about MIQ and I and I know people's experiences um, have been good and have been bad. But at the end of a campaign, at the end of a five-year cycle, like this is actually living the dream. Had an awesome room, food get dropped off to my door, <laughs> put my washing out. Um, yeah, this is this is awesome. Because I saw you commenting, I think it was after you won the gold medal, and we've got some video clip and stuff that we'll include in the podcast. Um, and I saw you commenting about you know being with the girls for for two months straight, sort of thing. Uh, is it feeling like? Are you saying now this is just nice to have my own space for a while? Not no commentary on not loving the girls, but it's just nice to be able to go. Oh, this is just me for a couple of weeks. Yeah, it is really nice. Like um, I've spent so much time in bed, just sleeping, catching up on sleep, um, and just giving my body a break. Like it's been a long time um, between doing stuff like that. But like I do miss them. I Facetime most of the girls every day just because I was wondering what they're up to. Um, and like you said, we've been together for so long and yeah, we've been together for two months, but we train together every day back in the mound as well. So, um, but yeah, I am enjoying having my own room and enjoying <laughs> having my own time to just hang out and chill. When you were at the Olympics, were you, were you doubled up? Were you, were you sharing rooms? I was actually lucky. I had a, my own room in our apartment. So we were in the apartment blocks. It was, um, eight people in an apartment and I yeah fortunately got my own room so you could hear everyone else though so it felt like you're all in the same room is that because there was cardboard beds and cardboard walls is that what they did <laughs> it was just I like divide oh they were proper walls but they're gonna get taken out as soon as we were out because they're m making them proper apartments but no it was good it was good well, look, thank you for joining us. I, I really, I genuinely appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you. And I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but just the the biggest congratulations to you for what you guys achieved. I know it's a full it's a full team effort. I get that. But, you know, you are the captain and I am speaking to you. So congratulations to you. It was amazing to watch. Uh, thank you. Like, um, I won't get sick of hearing congratulations <laughs> just because, one, thank you for watching and supporting our team. But... Like too, it's like I feel really proud to be bringing home a medal for New Zealand. It's um, like a dream that we've had for a very long time, and to achieve that, I'm I'm really proud of it. And yeah, it's I can't wait to get back home and show people in person. That's probably going to be the most exciting part. I talked to Eric Murray earlier this week. Obviously, double Olympic gold medalist rower, um, who's not there this time around, but he was kind of giving us a bit of a a, a bit of a story, and and he talked about. Because I, I was kind of like, you know, team sports at the Olympics, what do we do? What's the debate? Yada, yada, yada. And he was talking about, you know, when someone competes, and we were talking about athletics and rowing, but if someone competes at a regatta in uh, North America, in, you know, whatever, they're not, they are a New Zealand doer, but they're not ne necessarily representing New Zealand like you do at the Olympics. So Val Adams is shooting up. Oh, uh, putting the shot is that what it's called um at, in the diamond league yeah she's a new zealander she may even be wearing new zealand colors but it's not sort of an officially representing new zealand campaign and i was wondering 
for you guys who travel the world in the black jersey, you are always representing New Zealand. Did it feel different to represent New Zealand at the Olympics than, say, another sevens tournament somewhere else in the world? Yeah, like every, like you said, every time we play and every time we go on the World Series, we are representing New Zealand. But I suppose we look at it as we're representing the Black Fern Sevens, and um, which obviously sits in rugby and in New Zealand rugby. And um, and I suppose I haven't really thought about it like that until now. But when you go to the Olympics, you're representing like the actual New Zealand um, team. And that's really, really special. And I think for us as sevens players, for us in a team sport, that's what makes the Olympics so much more special is because you're a part of like this ginormous team that actually like, you, and we are, but you have to be respectful of so many other people. And it's not just about you guys. Like there's obviously every different sport in our, in the New Zealand team. So it's a real, um, like it's a really special time to be a part of that group and that was probably something of my best memories from Rio is being a part of something so much bigger than than Sevens. Obviously when you're in Rio and you had uh, the freedom to you know stay in the village for as long as you needed to and, and travel and see other events and that sort of thing Big and obviously with COVID and 2021 it's a it's a different scenario but was there anything this time around that you did manage to get along and see or was the lockdown so much you just basically were at your tournament and in the village and nothing else yeah it was really different this time around and that was just because of covid so we didn't go anywhere else we went into the village um probably later than what we'd wanted to but with covid that was just the way it was um went to the training field came back to the village went and played and then left the next day so that was hard when you want to support other people um and other team members but it's just, it was the way it was. And it kind of then turned into like a really nice thing when um, like Hayden first got his first medal and then the rowers. And then, so they would come back to the village and we would celebrate them winning medals. And that hasn't been done before. Normally they go to the New Zealand house and the celebrations are done there. But like, as soon as someone would send a text out, they're coming home, they've got a medal. Like our whole team would be down the bottom um, joining in the haka and, just built the excitement and like really like excited you to play i know you're talking to us on your phone so this might be a bit small but um let's just have a look at this for people who are watching if you're not watching jump on stuff.co.nz we'll play stuff and have a look what we're talking about this this is what you're talking about you girls coming home to the village check this out people it's fantastic yeah. <laughs> Um, I think, and I could be wrong in this, but I think I remember um, when Sarah Ulmer won her gold, um, gosh, 300 years ago, whatever that was. <laughs> I, She's the reason why I wanted to become an Olympic athlete. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. She well, is, yeah. I think I remember when she won her gold, I'm pretty sure she came back to the village and they gave her a haka. And that was the first time I'd ever seen it. And obviously what you're saying is now, because of the situation, it's 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 everybody. But there must, I mean, I was going to say, you know, how many times have you cried uh, since winning the gold? <laughs> because I, I think I think there's a lot of us out there who have you know kind of cried three or four times since you guys and other people around you have won the gold because it's very emotional. And this, this, this event, I'm pointing there because that's where my, my screen is. This hucker when you get back, it's... I don't know. I, I used to do talk back on News Talk ZB, and obviously, respectful to the people who listen to me, it's a, it's full of right wing rednecks, you know. <laughs> and um, and it's a lot of people of oh, you know, marry this and marry that. But I've always sort of been of the opinion it's it's the Maori culture that really defines New Zealand's uniqueness. Mm. It's the one thing that we have in New Zealand. And look, I'm I'm of Irish ancestry. I'm almost <laughs> pale blue. I'm so white, you know. But it's the one thing that defines New Zealand that's different as the literal, the one thing that defines us as different to the rest of the world. And I watch those huckers and I just go, Man, if if you want to get a snapshot, in my opinion, of why New Zealand is fucking awesome, mm. just look at what's going on there. Look at what these people are doing for each other. What's it like to be in it? Oh, like I've cried so many times in the last, <laughs> well, I'm going to say months. Just, yeah, that, 
the haka is special to us and that's what like our team is we pride ourselves on um on our culture and our maori culture but we've got someone um someone um people tongans um chinese and so everything is done to respect our cultures and then when you come into the new zealand team and they've really like um i suppose expanded the culture of the new zealand team and so there's now that new zealand team haka which everyone learned um and yeah when you get welcomed like that it's oh, it definitely pulls at your heartstrings to really proud to be maori proud to be a kiwi um and that was probably a really special one so we got welcomed in um so caleb from the rowing team yeah. he asked to say a speech asked to lead the haka and like for us is um like that's what made me cry even more that he took the time to want to do something like that for us and yeah it was um there was quite a few tears in that haka. do you know why do you know why caleb in particular wanted to lead that one and he was the co- he was the cox wasn't he in the in the rowing um why he in particular wanted to lead for you guys um so we'd met him in 2016 and he seen what happened um we seen what happened to the, to the roles at that stage and so created quite a nice connection and relationship with them and um a lot of us have kept in contact with a lot of the rowers and then when they won their um silver and then they watched us win our goal we just again had another bond and so he just said he, he really felt he needed to do that for us and mm. yeah i owe a lot of respect to him it's too cool, eh? I was also thinking yeah. it's too cool that it goes through the team now, and this is not to say in the past there wasn't the same respect, but my understanding is a lot of the times uh, in these bigger events, they always drag like the Sevens boys or the Sevens girls in, and like, hey, can we do one of these huckers? Can you guys come and lead it for us? But obviously you guys have gone, and the, I think the Sevens boys had gone when you got that hucker. They'd already left, is that right? Yeah, they were already at a hotel just waiting for us to finish. So, so, so that means you're, it's everybody now. Doesn't matter if you're, you know, in a, in a rugby team who does it at all the tournaments or or whatever. The whole team has got this cultural aspect, which gives us that uniqueness to it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, like even when you we were practicing at one stage before Hayden came back, there was um, heaps of countries had come around the corner to like look to see what was going on, and then all of them videoed. And like <laughs> we don't do it for that, but that signifies how special. Um, the haka really is and what you say it's, it sets us apart from the rest of the world I think. Have, have you ever had that interaction at an event? Have you ever had an interaction with another athlete? I mean it may not be the Olympics because I'm assuming you didn't mix with Russia so much because of COVID yeah. but um, did you ever have you had a reaction at Rio or at one of the events you've been at where people either ask or you explain or they, they talk to you about that relationship to do with the haka and how Kiwis do it? Yeah every single tournament we go to it's oh my God, you're the All Blacks. And I think that, um, like, with positivity, I really respect the All Blacks. So you're like, yep. And then they say, oh, the haka. And then they pretend to do the haka. And so, like, those two things signify being a Kiwi and what it means for the rest of the world, pretty much. Amazing. Now, speaking of emotional and shedding a tear, uh, talk to me about the... uh Obviously, it's not going to be quite the same experience as a "quote unquote" normal Olympics with a full stadium, but the the then honour of carrying the flag as well. <laughs> yeah, that was um, oh, like there's been a couple of moments in the last couple of weeks that have really got me good. Um, but carrying the flag, being named to carry the flag was a massive um, honour, and I, I was it was special. I got named back at home, so I got to actually share that with my family. Oh wow. Um, they got to come, and when I was cloaked back in the mount, I got my whole team there. So, like that experience was, yeah, it was pretty special. How does that happen? Then, how does that? How, do, how does? How does? literally? How do you find out? How did that happen? I Rob Waddell gave me a call one. It was a random training day. I was just at a training complex, and yeah, he just asked me over the phone, and so I didn't say very much back to him <laughs> because I was a bit in shock. So <laughs> I had to ring him back later on. So you had to accept. And there was that you could have declined it. People can decline it if they want. You had to actually accept it. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can uh, decline it. So tell me that. Why did you? I mean, I don't want anyone to think this is a disrespectful question. Like you shouldn't have had, it, obviously. But why did yeah. you? Why did you accept it? What was about it? So I was lucky. So he had already spoken to our coaching staff, so our management team, um, in New Zealand rugby, because 
obviously with COVID, there was a lot of changes, the flights, we might not even have been in the village at that stage. Um, so a lot of things had to happen for me to even be available to do it. So when he asked, I said, oh, I'd have to talk to my team. And he said that he had already actually talked to the team about it um, and they had okayed it. They, were, they would figure it out. So as soon as that happened, um, like I was just beaming with like pride and energy because like I've watched the flag bearers in the past and you look at them like they are the people that you will like well, I didn't ever aspire to be that person but they're just like those kind of people and then for me the turning point like wanting to accept it was ringing my husband and my and my dad here they were like this is the greatest honor you'll ever have in your life and wow so for me to me for me to be able to give that to my family that was yeah yeah, I wouldn't have turned it down for them. So there was an element of you accepting it was actually a respectful thing for other, like you hear about people who accept like a knighthood and they say, I'm accepting it because it actually acknowledges all the work that others have done around me as well. It's not just about me. Like our team's only been at the Olympics two times in its history ever. So for me to accept that honour, like now I'm like, well, being a rugby player, holding a flag at the Olympic Games, <laughs> how many other people are going to get that? that opportunity so i think if i can open up a door um then yeah i've done my part in rugby really as you were saying that like before you just said uh, how many people i was thinking sometimes i think about life and i think about you know who has experienced what and, you know until ed hillary did it no one had gone up mount everest now like 400 people go up a year sort of thing but <laughs> when it comes to the olympics the number of people who have carried the flag i mean gosh it, it, it must be less than 100 like in total sort of thing. I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, maybe it's less than 50. It's since 1896. That's only 120 years, four times. Every four years, it's 30 or, 30 or 40 Olympics. There might, there might only be 50, 60, 70 people who have done it ever for New Zealand. So that's a pretty amazing thing to... I'm going to say to have on your resume. It sounds a bit wanky, but you know what I mean. To have, in your, to, to, to have done. To have done sounds nicer. Yeah, it's, it's definitely weird. But I think like I'm... Um the one of the first oh, I am the first Maori person to do it at the opening ceremony as well and for me that was really special finding that out like there's the Lisa did it at the closing ceremony in 2016 but for the opening like I take real pride in that wow. was, yeah that, that makes me really happy wow that's really surprising that's re I'm, I'm surprised yeah. by that because because you know even thinking about you know the the um the importance that that Maori have and I mean I'm, I don't want to get I don't need to get into a conversation about in New Zealand that's a ridiculous conversation but within sport in New Zealand you know the over representation of Maori within sport in, in New Zealand I mean that's it seems uh, it seems what's the correct word to use it seems I was going to say unreal. It just seems a bit wrong, actually, that Māori haven't been represented yeah, in that I, position first. Like, I hope actually someone corrects me, but that was the yeah. research someone had done and told me in the past, so, yeah. Um, I want to ask you uh, a couple of things about the actual event. Excuse me, looking off to the side there, but I'm queuing up a video. Uh, <laughs> let's do uh, let's do this one first, right? Uh, I'm sure you know these things are kind of come out when I say I'm going to put some video on there. How about the end of the game? Here is the end of the game. <laughs> Kelly Brazier bangs it into touch. And a nation that has scaled every other peak in rugby now has the one prize that was missing. An Olympic gold. Black gold in Tokyo. New Zealand. I mean, you know, you, you, you top it off with uh, bloody Stan Walker in the background. That's pretty good as well to have that in there. <laughs> and that's actually one of our team songs. Like, oh. that song gets played three and a half minutes before we go out to warm up. Interesting. So that yeah I, like watching those videos back i'm in tears at the moment just that feeling came straight back to me and hearing that song is yeah massive it's um <laughs> yeah it, it is massive and look we can still see you there doing your yeah hanging out together and and what was going on um i asked eric murray this as well and and i'll ask you the same thing when did you know like when they're in the rowing race i'm like when do you know because it seems that people are very careful not to not to go until they're finished uh, and, I, and I think I was watching the boys score three tries in 90 seconds. Like, they definitely scored two in 60 seconds, like towards the end of one of their games. Um, so, you know, in sevens in particular, it can be go, but when did you go, this is ours, we got it, we got it? Um, and, like, I don't normally think like this, but probably two minutes to go was, um, yeah, that was the time where I was like, yeah, we've got it, we're 14 points up, we just got a penalty, 
Um, and then we ended up kicking for touch, doing a driving wall and like just doing things to kill the time. Cause you're like, we didn't need a play anymore. We just needed to kill the time to, um, yeah, to get the final whistle. So probably about two minutes to go, which is a long time in sevens. I know that. And we've come back from 21 points down in two minutes to, to win games. But yeah, that was probably a point in the final where I knew we'd won, which is a nice feeling. And then let's do this as well, eh? I mean, this is another one. This is I'm, I'm going to kind of cut part way into this because this is a bit of more of a compilation as to uh, I think Sky put this out as to the reaction of you guys once you had won. I don't think we need to have uh, need to have audio for this. We'll maybe have a little bit. So this is your actual reactions when you won. <laughs> I mean, what what are you what's going through your head in these moments? Oh, just like. You're just so happy. Like, uh-huh. there, you, you, we've worked five years for that very moment, and choose most days of my life, I'd visualise that that moment. And you kind of, um, I'm getting teary eyed thinking about it. But yeah, every single day you turn up to try and do that, and when it happens, it's just like there's a bit of relief there, but you're just overall happy. There's just pure joy in your heart, and um, yeah, you're just you're just pretty content at that time. <laughs> and again, not to not to kind of compete or compare with other tournaments, but you know the 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 Rugby World Cup. You've won a 15s Rugby World Cup. You know the Sevens World Cup. They're they're all four year tournaments. Does this still? And I'm not trying to disrespect those because they're mountains to climb. Does this feel different? The Olympics compared to those? Hundred percent. Yeah, the Olympics is the pinnacle of sport and. There's not many people, well, there's not many people who win World Cups either, but like an Olympic gold medal is the ultimate thing in sport. So, and in our sport especially. So, um, excuse me, I'm just getting another call. Um, <laughs> you're pop, so, for you're me, like, <laughs> just my husband. Oh, just your husband. He can wait. He can wait. <laughs> so, like, yeah. It, it, to be honest, it doesn't really compare. Like I really love the World Cups and the and winning those too, but yeah, this has been so much different. It's amazing. It's been an amazing, uh, amazing ride from this side of things as well. You talked before about the Stan, uh, the Stan Walker song. I was also wondering. I was actually I I got a photograph of you to put up on the um, on the thumbnail for this episode, and I saw you with some photos both before and after the the, the gold win, and I thought, gosh. In my head, I went, I wonder if any of those photos are kind of mock-ups. Like, you know, you took a photo with a gold medal before you won a gold medal. And then I thought, sorry, I'm explaining my long-winded question. I apologize about that. (laughs) Then I thought, you know, there are some athletes who won't do some things. Like, for example, before they play in the tournament, they won't touch the winning, you know, the winning thing. They're like, it's not mine yet. I can't own it yet. I can't touch it yet. It's not mine. So I won't touch that thing until I've actually won it. And I, and that might lead me into things about traditions and superstitions and pre pre game preparation. You've also you've already told us about Stan Walker's one of the songs you play for you personally or for the team. What are stuff that you guys do like immediately before the game, leading up to the game? Do you have any personal traditions or superstitions you go through? Like you have to put on one sock at the right way first, or anything like that? No, I don't. I don't have superstitions as such. Like I have a routine um, that I've had for a long time, and it's worked really well. Pre-game routine and stuff like that. But no, nah, other than like the three songs that we've got, um, Stan Walker's Aotearoa, um, and then we've got a couple of songs that we play just so pretty much post warm up, and it it's almost like the time. So as soon as the song one song comes on, you know you've got seven and a half minutes before you're walking out to play. Oh, cool. And we've had those songs for forever. Um, and they're just like real nice, feel good songs, pretty good to sing. So like other than those things, um, we're pretty easy going. Our team, as long as there's music blasting and everyone's having a good time, that's probably our like our superstition. So it's it's upbeat music to keep you up. It's not like you know some heavy hardcore drive you into a dark place, so you're angry and gruff and gruff and grumpy. <laughs> no, no, they're good feel good songs. The other thing I wanted to know is. Um, the way that you your your athletes talk about the other athletes for other teams, and it seems particular to the women's seven circuit, the way that I think you talked about Fiji, and I think Ruby talked about Russia, and it does really seem to be uh, more of a f- family is probably the wrong word, but certainly you know 
a, a kindred sort of you you're on this tour together for a long time i think even when ruby did that infamous tour uh, sorry that infamous interview on bbc i think she called the bbc reporter by their name so it seems that you all guys know each other really really well is is there like Forget COVID, obviously different scenario, but is there a really interesting vibe amongst all the athletes when you are all touring the world together and do you hang out and get on together? Yeah, yeah. We've So for me and some of the other girls, we've travelled with these other countries for the last 10 years. So you know them really, really well. And a lot of them, like I know their families and their partners now because of the amount of time we've spent together. So I'm, I like I would call a, a good group of them like good mates and I would happily catch up with them, have a drink with them, have coffee um, and are in constant contact with them. Um, and I think like in the early days of, of sevens and traveling and stuff, you tended to shy away from, well, I don't say, say shy away from them. You purposely ignored them. You didn't say hello to them. Um, and it was more of like a, I don't, like you because we're going to play you in the weekend and then you get tired of that and <laughs> you think well I see them every single month of the year so I might as well say hi and then it's like at the end of a tournament um, you go out for a drink and you get to know them and you have the same kind of interest and the same kind of passion so then it's just like a respect thing you're good friends with them play them can happily beat each other up and then as soon as the whistle blows out you're back to friends again so yeah, I, I enjoy a few of the, the girls' company. And the Olympics was quite different, though. Like, I think, because we haven't seen each other in a couple of years, you felt that almost flip back to, I don't want to talk to you. And you just felt the tension between teams. And um, and then once the groove starts going on again, you start yarning to the other players. But, yeah, definitely felt that from a, uh, from a couple of the other teams while we were there. Is that tension between teams, can that be a good thing? I mean, can that give you the separation to go harder, or is it not about that? Oh, no, I, th- I just think, like, when – I think for for us, like, if you're looking at a different team, like, m- most of the time you get along with everyone, but as soon as they start changing behaviours when you get to, like, a pinnacle event, that's when you know, like, are they really in the good headspace? And for one of the teams in particular, it didn't work for them and they got knocked out in the quarters. So you're like, well, maybe it didn't really work for them because they're normally quite a friendly team. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time. And obviously being female and stuff, you probably read into it too much. But <laughs> 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 Hey, um, I want to play another little bit of video here. It's you uh, talking to one of the New Zealand reporters when you came off the field immediately um, after the win. <laughs> It's pretty amazing, pretty excited. Sarah Hannan, uh, I finally get to say to you, Olympic gold medalist. What is going through your mind at the moment? <laughs> There's so much going through my mind. <laughs> oh, I'm just uh, so happy. I love you, Mum. I love you so much. How on was for you? And I am just so grateful to be a part of the best team in the world. Sure are, uh, with a gold medal around the neck now to prove it. I wanted to know about your support system at home, your your, your family, your whanau, uh, your husband. Obviously, um, um, I've read but haven't delved too deeply into it. You, you lost your mum fairly fairly recently. When did you lose your mum? When did that happen? I'm getting lunch. Um, I lost my mum five months ago in oh, February. I'm very, um, very, very sorry to hear that, just to, to say that. Well, I, I understand about what you're going through. So... The emotion for for that and the support group around you. Yeah, like um, it was actually a birthday, so like a bit of a sudden. Well, it was sudden, um, and like since then, it's yeah definitely put life into perspective. And to be honest, it was pretty hard to actually want to come back and play. Like I love rugby, and it definitely helped me get through some of the hard times and wanting to even get up in the mornings. But when you're in a team that is striving to be the best team in the world and pretty much is expected to win gold. Like it's really hard to even want or to even turn up and try and train as hard as we have to. But like I'm really fortunate as soon as it happened, like our family is pretty tight anyway. And, um, but like we, as soon as she passed away, we, we got to go to where she was. And to be honest, there was only supposed to be us immediate family in the room by half an hour of us being there. There was um, her six sisters, their husbands, their kids. Wow. Um, my dad's family had turned up and 
that's how special our family is and they didn't leave us until like four weeks after it happened we all just stayed together and then now we're all obviously in contact um all the time they've been messaging me as much as they can since I, when i was away but like yeah without having a close-up family i think that would have been really tough and i'm really lucky that my team's been really supportive of everything like mm. there was times i'd just leave training and go home because i couldn't handle being around people um two of the girls in the team kelly and Portia, they're my two best mates they were with me the whole time of mum's funeral they haven't really left my side either and like i'm constantly t- talking to them about things so without those people like i really don't know how i would have handled it and like my husband had to deal with a lot of stuff um just me constantly being at home and yeah pretty bad way at times so i come i think that's why like this is quite emotional winning this is like i get to go home and share it with them and for me like i messaged my family and i was like we did this like Mm. we won a gold medal so Mm. i can't wait they're they're already planning on having um catch-ups and Mm -hmm. um yeah but yeah well, once I get out, it'll be so nice to be able to just give it to them. Bringing my dad straight after that final was the best thing I've had. He's like been in a really bad place for five months, and to see him smile for the first time in a long time that was really special. Yeah, it's amazing, and it's not a it's not a kind of thing that that I can you can never speak to someone's experience because you're not walking a mile in their shoes. But you know, I, my family lost my mum a couple of years ago to motor neuron disease, and and it does bring. Yeah. A perspective to life that you don't have before um i i remember uh, it's funny uh, i see the outpouring of emotion now i i wonder uh how what you experienced going through the tournament if there was like a floodgate at the end because for me when i lost uh, when, when i lost my mum it was really weird because through the whole uh, period of sort of funeral uh, and that time family i i wasn't that emotional or not wasn't that i was suppressing or disconnected it was al- almost a bit like this is there's a job to do my mum needs this respect and we need to get through this and we need to do it the way she wants to do it and and then afterwards it was like the floodgates opened you know it was like the day after or the week after or the whatever sort of thing as well it was like the job is done uh, I, I wonder and I don't want to get all kind of gushy and emotional and you know I'm not I'm not I don't want to upset you or anything but you know was there an element of getting through getting the job done and then the chance for reflection and i was thinking you know if mum was looking down right now which i'm sure she is you know what would she be saying what would she be going through um oh like i oh to be honest i've probably just cried every day for the last couple months <laughs> and I, I don't mind that like i'm a pretty open person so i will sit in meetings and just bore my eyes out and everyone knows i'm okay um that I'll just need a bit of time and um so I like pretty much as soon as it happened to now I've yeah been pretty emotional but like I'm I'm happy with that I I know I need to do that um but she's my mum she was a she was a pretty bright person she had a really big energy about her and um like this is probably the one thing physically she hasn't seen me win and like I obviously know she was up there but um, she came to everything. She, I played 200 games for my team, and she surprised me in the south of France. Like she just <laughs> made things happen, yeah. and I don't know how she afforded <laughs> to pay for it, but she got there. She got my dad on board and got me. I got her there. So, um, but yeah, she would have been sitting in the stands with a beer in her hand, with a massive smile, and just bawling her eyes out. That was that was her. <laughs> well, maybe she was. Maybe she was anyway. I, I know she would have been. That's why our team waved it up at the stand. So, yeah. Now that that was one step too far. Just in that comment, that was. Whew, <laughs> whew, you've got to do this thing for your eyeliner, don't you? <laughs> hey, um, I, uh, you said your lunch just turned up. Do you, do you need to grab it? Do you want to grab it? Or are you okay for a few more minutes? It's all good. No one will if take it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you could have. You could, look, I've got my I've got my banana here. You could grab your kind. You can have it all there. Um, I saw this uh, on on YouTube, and I'm assuming you're. It's eight years ago, so you'll either be 19, 20, or twenty one in this. I'm assuming, um, and I wanted to ask you a question, which was about the 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 person you are today versus the person you were uh, in this conversation. We don't need to play the conversation. Oh, it didn't even come up. We'll go back a bit. Uh, 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 This conversation. That's a long time ago. (laughs) Yeah, the person in this conversation. 
uh, because, uh, and it sort of reflects a little bit on what we're talking about now. Uh, so this is eight years ago. Uh, I said, I'm not I'm interested in playing the video. I just wanted to see you eight years ago on the screen, right? Because uh, what I wanted to know is, you know, you today, what would you say to that you eight years ago? What advice would you give or what would you uh, want to impart into that child of a Sarah <laughs> that we're looking at on the screen, you know, because you're a completely different person today than you were then and you've got a completely different life and you've had a completely different path the last eight years. What would you want to pass on? Um, like the, the passion and love that you have for the game then is you still have that eight years later. Wow, cool. Um, the drive you have to be a better person is still there. Um, there will be times on that eight year journey that you will be pushed right to the limits of wanting to give up. But I tell you what, it's worth it in the long run and you will make some friends that you'll have forever in your life. Um, and yeah, there, there will be some hard times, some really, really dark places, but um, I can definitely tell you it's worth it. Is that the biggest medal, the biggest medal, the biggest win out of the sporting career you've had so far? Not not to imply that it's going anywhere, but that you've had so far, you, you mentioned the friends. Is it the friends that have come out of it, which is actually the best gold you've had? That, like uh, Everyone asks why I play rugby, why I, I suppose give up my life and my body to for the sport sorry um and it's because of the people I get to meet the like the friends I have because of this team like two of them were my bridesmaids at my wedding I was at theirs and we've got another one in December so <laughs> yeah I'll be but yeah I'm really thankful for that it's amazing Hey, uh, look, I mean, it's been an amazing chat. I wouldn't mind uh, a couple more quick questions for you. Uh, we're just talking about your career, and I'm wondering what is there still to do? What What is there? I know that it's a stupid question. It's kind of like the day after someone has a baby. Oh, so you're going to have another baby? You know, but uh, it's, it's so it is silly, and I had the same silly conversation with Eric Murray earlier in the week. But, you know, you've, you've done the Commonwealth Gold. You've done the Rugby World Sevens. You've done the Rugby World Cup. You've done the Olympic medal, you know, what you've been kept are you you were captain at 20 is that right i'm pretty sure that video was like talking to the captain and you were 20 yeah i think 2021 yeah. crazy so so it seems yeah. to those of us on the outside looking in who when we grow up we want to be like sarah hidden is is you've done it all <laughs> so far you know what is there still to do what do you still want to do oh, like, i don't know i've been asking myself that the last few days um like I know I want to go for another Olympic, so I don't think I'm I'm finished yet. Cool. Um, so 2024 is definitely like on the horizon, but there's definitely things I want to do in the meantime. And um, yeah, next year is kind of hard because there's a Commonwealth Games, a Sevens World Cup, and a Fifteen World World Cup within like four months of each other. Wow. Yeah. So like, oh, if I got an opportunity to play Fifteens World Cup in New Zealand, I'd jump at the chance and, and want to go for of, it of, the, of those three things if you could only do one would it be the 15s at the top oh if i only do one geez, that's <laughs> tough that's tough i don't know if i could make that decision all right if i could do all three i would happily um but yeah playing a world cup in new zealand would be pretty unreal i think yeah but there's so much i want to do um in rugby out of rugby i want to get my pilot's license at the end of the year choice um yeah and at some stage in uh, my career, I want to start a family as well. So, And what about, I mean, it must be a conversation you guys have either with yourself, with your with your family and support, or, or with, you know, amongst each other as sort of post-rugby. Do you, you know where you're, I'm not saying that's anytime soon. No, give me the ride. But, you know, do, do those conversations happen? Always, yeah. Like most days. We've got a personal development lady, um, Nikita. She's absolutely amazing. Um, and she's big on us having balance and, she doesn't care what we do as long as we're doing something outside of rugby. And to be honest, I love that, like actually being allowed to do something because I would get quite bored just having one thing and I need like a different stimulus. So, um, yeah, I've studied and doing a few things outside of it, which is nice, but 
um, yeah, I don't know what I want to actually do once I retire, um, but there's definitely, I will keep options open. It's pretty amazing that we're in a different age now where athletes can also earn for what they're doing and earn fairly well, even though beyond, for, for I think for most, it's not so secure. But I was talking to Ian Smith, the former New Zealand wicketkeeper, who's now obviously a commentator on Sky Sport, and he started that job at a 97, 98, 99 working for Sky Sport, and he said to me in the podcast that he finished cricket and he had nothing. He basically was saying he didn't have money in the bank, and I'm not saying he was a pauper. Please, I'm I'm not putting those words into his mouth. But he was basically saying he, he didn't he needed had to go out and get a job, and luckily hit for him that Sky Sport turned up and he's been there ever since. But um, I think we live in an age today where it's better than that. But probably for most athletes, it's it's can be not that much different. They still need, it's not like a LeBron James where you, you know, can get 130 million in one season <laughs> and then you can just you could live off. It. I, I think I could manage 130 million for the rest of my life. I think I'd be okay. <laughs> But you know, that would be quite nice. Yeah, <laughs> we're definitely not on those kind of contracts. Hey, a question that I've got for you, which was actually prompted by you before we started this podcast, was the whole um, uh, Adidas Olympic Games thing thing the my professionalism um because i was unaware I, I you know what this shows my age i remember in 1992 at the olympic games when the dream team played right i was i was, I was four years old and i was much older than that um but i remember there was when they won their gold medal the dream team um the the basketball team was sponsored by adidas but people like michael jordan were obviously sponsored by nike or Air jordan there was nike at the time and um there was talk about them not going to get the gold medals because Jordan refused to wear a Adidas top because he had a massive contract. And they ended up by by draping uh, the American flags around the, uh, the, the, the track suits. So no one got a photo of Jordan wearing Adidas. That was sort of the sum title. Now, New Zealand rugby, I think, in general, they're all Adidas at the moment, but you weren't allowed Adidas at the Olympics. How did that all pan out? Um, yeah, so it's just, just different sponsors sponsoring different things and like, uh, being a part of Blackburn Sevens, yeah, sponsored by Adidas, and I have a personal deal with Adidas as well. So pretty much my whole life is Adidas. And then, but in the New Zealand team for everything but performance, it's peak, and that's who sponsors the New Zealand team. Um, we were allowed to train. We got given, sorry, training and playing Adidas team wear, and that's because peak don't do performance wear. So. Um, Adidas was still allowed to do that but like for now up until a period it's peak um, and yeah we're just respecting our sponsors obviously they give a lot of money to um, support our program so um, during the New Zealand Olympic period it's peak and then pretty much the rest of my life is Adidas. <laughs> is there kind of a vibe around the Olympics where I mean I imagine in business you know apparel companies it'd be pretty cutthroat do, do they kind of come to the party, quote unquote, for the Olympics? It's a bit different where Adidas can go, okay, Pete can do that. And Pete goes, okay, Adidas can do that. But it seems that, because I mean, I'm surprised to see how easily you can kind of go from one to the other in a professional era. But does the Olympics create that atmosphere that maybe they seem, and I'm not saying either one is better or worse, but together they seem more amenable? Yeah, I'm not sure how, but to be honest, I don't really know how that works. Um, like our manager just tells us the times you're allowed to wear this and the times you're wearing this. So, yeah, and for us, like, I just, uh, I'm just i happy to be respectful of that. I know there's a lot of money that goes into it, so I don't want to piss anyone off. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm looking I'm looking this way, and I and I want to, because that's where my screen is looking at you. Let, we've got to see the medal. Can you put it on and tell us a bit yes. about tell about what it 100%. feels like to put it on? Yeah, let's see it. Oh, yeah. There it is there. It's nice and sparkly. Oh. Can't wear it too long. But, yeah, it's pretty unreal, really. So look at the smile. Tell me. Tell me the th <laughs> thoughts right now with the smile. I know, right? Instantly. Like, you can't not wear it and smile. It's beautiful. Are you going to be one of these people to, to pass it around, to let everyone put it on, or are you going to be someone to hold it quite tight? What, do you, what are you thinking? No. No, 100%. I'm all about sharing it. There's been not just me who got to this point. So as soon as we get back to Tauranga, um, I'm sure I won't see it for a couple of days. And not out of respect for not wanting to, but there'll be a lot of people who I want to want to have um, to allow them to have it as well. You always hear about, uh, you know, actors, actresses. I think Reese Witherspoon's one of these people who keeps her Oscar in the toilet. 
because when they're in the bathroom, people can always, you know, they're always, <clears throat> yeah, not to be too too forward, but they're always sitting with a bit of time to spare. Um, and that's where she keeps it. Uh, have you got? Where's it going to go in the house? Do you know yet? No, I, I don't know. My husband will probably find a place for it, but on the bookshelf seems like a good idea. That's when where they normally go when you first get home. So actually, to be honest, it probably won't even be put down for the next month. So... <laughs> As it should be. It should be passed. I mean, when I say it should be, I mean your business. But, you know, if, if you're going to share it, share it around. It's amazing. I, I, I was I was saying to a previous guest, and the what that can do for a young person, I still remember being 10, 12 years old, and I don't know why it was there, but the Ranfurly Shield was in my house. And I can still <laughs> remember holding the Ranfurly Shield. I can still remember the photo that was taken of me holding the Ranfurly Shield. I don't have the photo anymore, but it imprinted so much, I can remember the photo. Um, and, you know, just touching and holding those things can, can like you say, Sarah Ulmer, who has inspired you, that, that'll inspire, you know, the, the 2050 Olympic Sevens captain, perhaps, to hold that today. Mm. I hope so. I really, really hope so. Like, I got to meet Hamish Carter at the Olympics, and I watched him race and win his gold, and, yeah, meeting him was pretty awesome too. And like, like those have impressions on people, and I just hope that I've given an impression to someone who might be struggling, who wants to just carry on with life. That's that's important to me too. Have you ever met Sarah Alma? No, I haven't. I would love to. Is that would that be a fangirl moment? You know, would that be like that a would... are, the, are there these people that you still kind of go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm meeting so and so. I will be like a giggly mess, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and because it was Sarah Alma who drove you, or you know, inspired you, why did you end up in rugby and not, let's say, cycling? Well, because I couldn't afford a push bike. That's <laughs> 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 probably the number one reason. <laughs> Oh, well, look, Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've laughed, we've cried. It's been such an interesting conversation. Um, how long before you're back with Connor and the rest of the whanau? Um, I think it's like 10 days now. 10 so from days, now? My, yeah, oh my yeah. Gosh. Another 10 days. So not too long. It's got, I feel like it's going pretty quickly. He's probably thinking otherwise. Um, I've been away for two months now, so. I feel like I want to touch base with you in about eight and a half days because at the moment you're going like, oh, you know, this is just a dream. I get to relax in my body. And then like in eight days, you'll be like, oh, I've got to get out of this place. Yeah, it's five star, but i got to get out of this place. <laughs> I have told my family, I've been like, you're good. Yep, yep. And I'm like, message me on day 10. Then that will be the teller, I reckon. So, yeah, we'll see on day 10. And, and, and coming up to pick you up, be waiting outside or are you flying down? What's the story? So we fly to Tauranga and yeah, he'll be at the airport waiting. Oh, Him and my dog. I can't yeah. wait. Oh, you got what kind of dog have you got? We've got an Airedale Terrier. He's um, his name's Booker. Oh, nice. I've got a, awesome. a, a Border Collie who's in the studio, but she's just taken off. So <laughs> she's got her own. Uh, there's cool. there's a puppy cam over to my down there, but she's not in the studio at the moment. She's taken off somewhere. So <laughs> yes. she flicks around. I love that. Hey, look, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Uh, like I said, and I, and I say this, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like Sarah Hinnane. It just means, you know, we are so impressed with you as a person and as an athlete, probably more importantly as a person, though. You know, it's um, it's just we're all so proud of all of you athletes over there, and the guys who have done gold. It's just the the icing on the cake. You know, if people people finish fourth or fifth or eighth or whatever, we're still incredibly proud of the effort put in, the years of work for maybe little to no recognition to still make it as an Olympian and compete. And you guys that are bringing back the prizes, I think I read yesterday that this is our most successful Olympics ever. Um, and yeah, I think we're I think yeah. we're about tenth on the table out of two hundred and five countries. What the hell is that? It's amazing, you know. And we'll probably we'll, yeah. we'll probably have another one today in the K four, hopefully, with um, geez, that little pocket rocket who's bringing home a, a vast <laughs> amount of Olympic gold medals. <laughs> It's not doing too bad, eh? Yeah. So, look, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done and for, for spending some time with us. Congratulations again. It's amazing. Um, and I know it's a silly thing to say we can't do it, but as much as you can, pass on all our absolute best to the other girls. Um, and all of this kind of praise and adulation obviously goes to them as well for what they've achieved. It's been amazing. Thanks so much. No, all good, team. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.